Do you like sports? Do you like art? What about science? Giraffes? Giraffe scientists that paint rugby games? It's all available on Audible, the biggest audiobook site with the largest selection of audiobooks this side of the inner solar system. No need to use your boring old eyes anymore. The ears are the future, my friend. Why, you're using them right now. So check out Audible and get your listen on. Go to www.readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to start your 30-day free trial today. And I think that anger and a sense of injustice has a massively transforming effect on people um, and just can, can turn you into someone you didn't know you were capable of being. Um, and, and I really think that's what happens to her. I think that, that that's the point at which she's beginning to tear down the walls of her house and emerge anew. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 27. Let's all hope we don't become part of the 27 Club. As always, if you have ideas for books you'd like to see featured or have authors you want to put me in touch with, you can reach me at jon at readlearnlivepodcast.com. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with author Karen Swan about her book, The Paris Secret. Karen Swan began her career in fashion journalism before giving it all up to raise her three children and a puppy and to pursue her ambition of becoming a writer. She lives in the forest in Sussex, writing her books in a treehouse overlooking the downs. Her books include Christmas at Tiffany's, Summer at Tiffany's, The Perfect Present, Christmas in the Snow, Christmas on Primrose Hill, and The Paris Secret. Note that it is indeed The Paris Secret, and thus a portion of this interview contains spoilers. I have inserted a spoiler alert just beforehand, so you can skip ahead if you intend on reading the book, but please definitely come back to listen to that portion, because that part of the discussion was amazing. Without further ado, my discussion with Karen, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the Read, Learn, Live podcast. I am your host, John Monaster. Today I'm here with the author of The Paris Secret, Karen Swan. Karen, say hello. Hello, everyone. Great. Uh, we're so excited to have you. This book was really interesting. I uh, was really glad to get a chance to read it, and now I'm even happier to talk with Karen about it. So, Karen, uh, I always like to start off with a, a brief summary of the book in your own words. So let's hear, let's hear what you think the book is all about. Um, well, it's uh, based on the real life event of uh, uh, an apartment in Paris that was discovered a few years ago uh, that hadn't been opened since the Second World War. It had been locked for 70 odd years um, and um, many great artifacts and paintings were found inside. Um, and so I, I've wrote, written a story around that, really, um, concerning a, a character called Flora Sykes, who's a, a private art agent. Um, and she is tasked um, with going into the, uh, entering the apartment, inventorying uh, what they find there, and then having to trace the provenance of, of everything that's found within, with the uh, view of taking it to auction. The story is based on true events, and I read uh, in a different interview that you found all this out on Twitter, which is a great, great story in and of itself. So um, can you maybe break down a little bit more detail which parts were actually from the true story versus the one from, you know, that you made up? So, I mean, um, there, there were a few photos uh, online that I was able to um, look at, and I absolutely poured over them to, to see what was in them. Um, that there was nothing of particular note. There was nothing that really stood out apart from, for me, an ostrich. It had no, no financial value at all, but I loved the ostrich. It was, it was hugely indicative of the, the sort of lifestyle that had been lived by the owners of that apartment. Um, so I, 
I decided to, the, the question that concerned me more than anything was why had this apartment been left? You, it was completely obvious as to why it should have been abandoned. The Nazi occupation of Paris meant that uh, in June 1944, I think it was, meant that many Jewish families were fleeing. So it was understandable that it was locked up. But why had it been left? And so I, 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 I once I had simply established that this apartment was there, was full of beautiful art and had been abandoned, everything after that point is fictional. So I I did take the ostrich and I have put the ostrich in, but I've made up the art that was in there. Um, I, 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 because, because the fact, when, when you're dealing with something that has its roots in truth, you need to be very careful about how you represent it and what you're saying, because of course, you, you don't want to present something as a truth if it's not. So I, I didn't want to get too involved with this is the story of this actual apartment. So I I took that little nutshell, that kernel of truth, and then I and then I fictionalized the whole thing. So everything that you read, apart from the ostrich, has been I've literally made up. Fair enough. And the ostrich is named Gertie yeah. for those of you. I don't know why. I don't know why. No, it's a great, it's a great name. I think it's perfect. So what was the, what was your writing process like? How did you sit down and make this book come together? This one was actually pretty good to write, um, mainly because with the character of Flora, I knew her really quickly. I find names really important for informing my impression of a character. And it's pretty much the first thing I'll start with. Once I know vaguely what the plot is, I then start looking at the characters. And the first thing I'll do for them is find them a name. And I hit upon the name Flora Sykes and I absolutely knew who she was. I could just see her walking down Bond Street. And I, I used to work in the fashion industry and worked in that area around Mayfair. And our offices at Condé Nast were really quite close to Sotheby's. So you would see all the Sotheby's girls wandering around. And, and you know, they are a type. I mean, as they are at Condé Nast and in other worlds as well, you get you get types. So I suppose it, she was slightly drawn from that. And she felt so familiar to me that um, I then started researching how she was going to come into the action. You know, what, was she going to be an agent? Was she going to work for Sotheby's? Was she, you know, it, the, the I didn't know anything about uh, fine art agents until I started looking into how to tell this story. Because one of the hardest things when you're writing a book isn't actually coming up with a story. It's deciding how to tell it and how to pace it. Um, so her job was really important for how I revealed the mysteries that were in were in the uh, um in the apartment. And uh, so I sort of moved the action from London to Paris very quickly within one scene. Um, but I had great fun setting up all the action with um, uh, a, 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 a sale room at, at Sotheby's, uh, a great sale happening, which was really set up her character and how controlled she is um, and how, how contained, uh, completely not driven by passion or high feeling, very much operating within herself. Um, and then sort of moved the action immediately over to Paris and, um, and, and then really it became detective work. I had to understand the logistics of how you trace art. I had to do a huge amount of research into, um, the art of provenance and, and, um, how you go about proving ownership or lineage of, of a painting. So it, it almost in parts felt like writing a detective novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was that's what I was thinking about actually. I mean, that's really what a good chunk of that was when Flora was trying to understand what what had happened and what was going on yeah. and then as deepening secrets were uncovered just to really get to the bottom of it. So Yeah. Yeah, no. It was really interesting. It was it was great fun and I've I'm not a great one for massively plotting my stories, which drives my husband mad because he's an accountant. So, of course, everything is on a spreadsheet for him. But for me, I, I only ever know about two steps ahead. And and uh, I, I know the overarching narrative. Um, and I, I know I've got to get from A to K to Z, but I don't know the points in between. And it's always a bit of a muddle working my way through. And on this one, I, I, I got a bit of a... Um, a surprise when I got to just before the halfway point 
And I suddenly realized I was going to have to do a big reveal, which I hadn't realized I'd have to do at that point in the book. And I thought, God, I'm only halfway through it. But actually, I realized once I got to it, it totally had to be that way. But I didn't know it was going to be that way until I got there. Yeah. So you talked a bit about the research work you did. Um, there's a lot of history in this book. There's a lot of uh, things that I was you know, really, I went and looked them up myself. I was really impressed that, you know, they were, they existed, they were there, and you had spent a lot of time on all of this. So how did you decide what to include from historical perspective? And how did you go through the research? And, you know, for instance, the OSC was one thing that I had no idea existed, but was really fascinated to find out about. Yeah. I mean, I, so it helped that I had done um, an A-level um I don't know how that translates for you. It's it's sort of, you know, um, a higher education. It gets you into university or A-levels. And I, I'd okay. done an A-level in um, uh, modern history, which had in included Nazi Germany. So I had a basic understanding of a lot of what had happened in the war. Um, and I, I always find war quite a, um, a fascinating period to write about because it... it it makes people ordinary lives extraordinary. You know, normal people suddenly can become heroes or villains, of course. You know, you have to at some point pick a side morally. And um, so I, I've all, I'm always interested in war because I think there are great stories there. Um, and, and there's so much more to war than merely fighting and casualty. You know, there's, there's, it's, it's such a rich bed of inspiration. Um, so... I started, I mean, I, I, I do probably three, two to three months of research before I start writing. And I write down everything in my notebook. I've got a big leather notebook that comes everywhere with me. And it all goes down in there. And I probably only put in about 15% of what I know by the end. Um, because you, you've got to be careful not to just sort of want to put in information just to be clever, just to look impressive. It's, it's got to obviously be valid for the story and, and, and to those characters. You don't want it to read like a textbook. So it's a, as much a question of knowing what to leave out as to knowing what to put in. Um, I, I think there are so many people who have done extraordinary things that will have already been forgotten, that will never be told. Um, and what I write about in the book is although it, it isn't based on a specific true act, it is inspired by many similar other acts. Um, I read some really fascinating um, accounts of how people outwitted and outsmarted the Nazis. One of the things that I was really impressed by was all the art in the book, and it, and it really made the book uh, a compelling read because I enjoy art, and it's, and it's fun to think about art. And as you mentioned, you created a lot of art for this book. So I'm just a bit curious about that process, right? I mean, you had to sit there and create beautiful works of art. Not only did then you create them, you had to develop a way to describe them in writing something that was inherently visual. I mean, most of the works of art in the book are paintings. There's some sculpture. Uh, but maybe can you talk a sec about that process of creation of, of visual art and then figuring out a way to write about it? Mm. I, I, was, I had to decide pretty early on whether or not I wanted... Um, to be discussing an actual real piece of art or a fictional one. And I decided it had to be a fictional one because I, I couldn't ascribe a real piece to a fictional history. So I had to start from scratch, which is really hard because I'm not an artist. Um, but I do, through the process of my work, build worlds every day. I have to... I'm literally week, well, days away from sitting down and writing chapter one of my next book. And I will have to pull from the air an entire world that does not yet exist. And within that world, you, you have to know every element of it. Um, so if, if I am describing a room, I may only show to the reader the chair and the table. But in my head, I will know where the window is and what the plant is on the windowsill and the curtains and who made them. I need to know that detail so that I can sort of move with authority through these scenes and, um, you know, convey that to the reader. So 
I'd, I'd been to France uh, very recently. I go, I go over to France quite a lot. Obviously, it's so easy from London. Um, so I'd been over. I, I'd been to the, uh, the Monet Museum, um, obviously the Louvre and the Jeu de Paume and, and Musée d'Orangerie. And I I'd sort of looked at a lot of Impressionist painting and um, I decided on a Renoir just because it's easier actually to describe than for example a Monet something deeply impressionist which is more abstract and I you know would be harder to convey to the reader I wanted something that would be easy for the reader to visualize so that they could hold it almost had to be sort of totemic they had to be able to just hold it in their mind's eye um and and so you know, once I decided on that, I was, I was sort of able to take all that experience of going over to Paris and plus everything that I had researched, looking at Nazi art, um, looking at cases of restitution of Nazi art, like the Gustav Klimt from the state of Austria. You know, you, you sort of start looking in more detail at actually what it was the Nazis stole. Um, and, I, and I was able to sort of conjure this this painting. Um, there was also, it should be should say, that there was found in the apartment Uh, a very beautiful um, portrait of a woman who was actually, I think, the grandmother of the owner of the apartment, Master Florian. Um, And she was um, painted, it was a Belle Epoque painting, and she was painted by this Italian artist, Giovanni Beldini, I think his name is. And um, that recently went to auction and because of the provenance of it being found in uh, in this apartment in Paris, which by now was quite famous, it went for three over three million pounds, which was way above its sort of list price ordinarily. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a very, very beautiful painting. And I stared at it for a really long time. And I did think, shall I make this the centerpiece of the story? I decided not to, but um, it is it is sort of the template for the the lesser painting that I discuss in the uh, in the book uh, of the woman in the beautiful green dress. Um, that's sort of the template f- for that. Um, but again, I just couldn't go too close to the truth because, you know, I was creating new worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you do so quite nicely. So. All right. Let's get into the, the meat of the book itself. So um, we've we've tiptoed around it but let's let's start talking about some of the characters um so flora 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 is our protagonist and she is obviously a very very interesting person interesting character so you wrote some stuff about her up front as you were introducing her to the reader you wrote as the only girl and the baby of her family she had grown up adored and yes indulged and later on you mentioned that she had breezed through life popular and well liked so uh, that's a very interesting thing to write about someone who is sort of a hard-nosed detective and really someone who's just driven to find the truth and uh, uh, very passionate about what she does. Uh, what really drives and motivates her now? Why is it that someone who sort of was able just to breeze through life and was indulged, now able to be such a great detective and unearth and understand secrets that the world is, is presenting her, which is going to make people mad at her. Yeah. More so when she knows this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, she was a, a, quite a different character for me to write, actually, because she's so together. And she's she's almost, I hate to use this word. I, it's not a word I ever like to use in real life or in fiction. But to a lot of people, they're probably going to think she's quite perfect. You know, she she's living, she's very secure. She's loved. She's got a lovely family. She's never wanted for anything. She's got a great career living in London, de- dealing with, you know, priceless works of art on a daily basis, traveling the globe. So she kind of has it all. But that was what made her interesting to me, because actually... She's numb. Nothing has ever really happened to her. And she sort of lived within this sort of clinical little bubble where life has been quite easy. She's never had to strive. People naturally like her. She's very attractive. She can kind of get any man she wants. She looks great in clothes. But actually, she doesn't, she's never really been in love. She's never really lost her heart. She's She's never really known great passion. And the journey for me with her was actually to get her to feel. And she she is actually craving a wild, not a wilder life, but a more vivid life. 
she wants to feel more. You know, I, I, it, it's a source of sadness for her, and I hope that it comes across in the book, that actually she's never been in love. On the plus side, she's never had her heart broken, but she's never been in love. Sort of, she's almost Teflon plated. Life sort of bounces off her, and she's moving through without really ever connecting. So when she's sort of on the case for this, she's a bit like a dog with a bone because she she knows that there is more. And it, it's not that she needs to prove herself to anyone, but she needs she, ne she needs to connect and she mm -hmm. can't let the truth slide away just for the sake of maintaining a, a, a positive, smiling relationship with her clients. There's no way she can hide the truth from them. They're not gonna be able to go forward and sell that collection. So her hands are tied in that regard, but she's, I think she's looking for integrity. I think she's looking for authenticity and connection. Hmm. Which is really interesting. And I think that's, I think you, you, you encapsulated that correctly. And I think that that's a really interesting point in that there's still something to, there's still something interesting about someone that's perfect. You know, oh, absolutely. That there's, still, there's still plenty of uh, grist for the mill there. Oh, I just think perfection is not something any of us should ever strive for. I'm, I'm so anti right. it. And right. uh, I, I always just think that we're all works in progress. Um, and that, you know, when people say, oh, so-and-so's life is perfect, I think, God, no, you don't know the first thing. Of course it isn't. No one's life is perfect. You know, the yep. wheel keeps turning. I, I did um, English at university and there, I did medieval English. Um, and there's a device that was used in um, literature back then called the Wheel of Fortune, which was that um, it would, um, you'd have a jester and a king and you'd have, the, you'd have the wheel turning and the king would be sitting on the top on the top of the wheel, on top of the world. But of course, when you're on the top, the wheel continues to turn and eventually mm. you're gonna be under the, the wheel. And when you're at the bottom of the wheel, well, you know the wheel's gonna keep turning and you're gonna to get to the top again. And I think there's, there's sort of great hope for when you're underneath the wheel, wheel, but equally when you're on the top of the world, there can be a feeling of things might be about to fall apart. So mm. that's something that I'm, I, I never think of, um, lives as being at fixed points. I think that there's always flux. There's always change. Yeah. So I think that's a perfect connection to our next, or to my next question, which is about uh, the Vermeils. Vermeil? Is that? Vermeil. But, but yes. Vermeil? Yeah. We'll, we'll do Vermeil. Okay. So the Vermeils are this just enormously wealthy family, and they there's a whole suite of characters there and they play, they are the, the sort of the main actors beyond Flora in the book. So just talk a bit about each of those characters and, and who, who they are and how they play a role in the book and what motivates them. So they are the clients, Flora's clients. They are the owners of the apartment. Um, although it's still in the name of, um, the, the grandmother figure, Magda Verme. Um, and she, um, the principal character that we really are interacting with is, is the wife, Lillian, who's a very cool, chic Parisian, very tall, very um, elegant, very spare, uh, rather unemotional. And her husband, Jacques, who is a warmer character, he's a, a cardiologist. Uh, he doesn't need to work, but he does. Um, and they're a very well connected family. They um, they're politically connected um, socially. They're on the board of everything. Um, and then they've got their twins, Xavier and Natasha. And Natasha is very much the sort of Euro trash uh, wild child, a bit out of control, always in the papers. Uh, and then Xavier, who's pretty similar, not, not as wild as his sister, but he's a known playboy and, um, uh, you know, doesn't set, doesn't have a job that we know of um, and is just very much on the international scene. And um, initially, I actually wanted to have more of the character through Lillian, um, the wife, but I, I actually had, I wanted it all to come down through her family, but, but for logistical reasons, I had to make it about her husband uh, because of to do with name changes and 
names being passed down through marriage. So it had to be about him, but she was the focal point of the family for me. Um, and I really enjoyed the process of sort of warming her up as a character through the story. Um, she starts off as, a, as incredibly um, reserved, I suppose we'd say. And by the end, she's, she's a real linchpin for her family. And she's, um, I, I had great fondness for her. Uh, Natasha, I wanted to slap throughout most of it. I mean, <laughs> she was... As did everyone. Yeah. Right? I think that's, that's the point. Exactly. You know, um, but obviously I knew through the process of writing her why she was that way. Um, and, and I felt a huge tenderness towards her. Um, Xavier was sort of harder to write. Um, he, he developed almost accidentally in terms of, I didn't quite know how I was going to introduce him to Flora. And it was, um, I hadn't specifically planned it out, going back to my earlier comment of, I don't know until I get there. Um, but I was writing a particular scene where, um, Natasha and, um, Flora are having, uh, an altercation in the apartment uh, over, over Gertie the ostrich and um, and he walks in and he immediately takes his sister's side and it instantly polarizes the two of them and that was sort of great because as soon as I did that I realized okay you know they've chosen their camps that you know they cannot be friends and that was great because it, it not only set up his very close bond with his twin sister but it also estrange them from the get-go which of course is always great fun for creating tension so yeah, yeah. yeah. it's quite pleased <laughs> yeah yeah they were a really interesting family to to get a handle on so there were there was a couple other characters there's and i'll, I'll go to you for pronunciation again there's angus mm, yeah angus angus okay and either ines or ane oh inez yes inez yeah. okay um, it's funny to think about pronunciation because the entire book I had certain pronunciations in I know. my head, right? And they're different than yours. I know. Um, a friend of anyways, mine, her, her godson is called Xavier, but she calls him Xavier. And she said yeah. this to me and I was like, what? You say Xavier? Yeah. And I said, no, I've written an entire book and he's Xavier. It right. shortens to Zav, but you know. Right. <laughs> Maybe different. like a pronunciation guide at the beginning of the book. Yeah, I know. Make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, but those two... Uh, were sort of two of the most interesting ancillary, ancillary characters in the book. Yeah. And Angus uh, was Floor's boss and at, at several occasions made sort of a money-hungry decision. Uh, but also he was very empathetic and kind of connected with Flora as she was going through a lot. One of the kind of running jokes is she kept trying to quit and he kept refusing to let her quit or to fire her. So I thought it was so interesting. He was really able to develop this empathy for Flora, but also he held on to this kind of desire and need for money, uh, like when he put the Renoir painting up for auction before kind of any anyone knew exactly where it came from. So that's a really complex character to me. So maybe just talk a little bit about how he was able to hold those two, um, what some people might think of as competing desires. Yes, yeah. I mean, he's... Um... In a way, he's a little bit of a, a buffoon. He's a bit of a public schoolboy type, supremely self-confident, uh, very assured of his place in the world. Um, he's set up his own company and, you know, dealing with incredibly uh, powerful and influential and well-connected clients. Um, and at the end of the day, it's big business. Art is huge. And that there's there's a lot of money in it for for private sales. I mean, I was looking through my notes and I'd written down that sixteen and a half percent of Sotheby's business is conducted through private sales. So not through the auctions at all, but you know through private sales that they broker between um, sellers and buyers. Um, so there's very big money to be made in this. Um, but I also don't think the characters who want to be ambitious need to be completely ruthless or ball breakers. I mean, Angus is rather unprincipled and he does go ahead and he makes a very rash de decision that could really bring everything crashing down around them. Um, but he's fundamentally 
a good bloke you know <laughs> he's you know he is he's and and he's a nice bloke and he's he, he loves a bit of drama and and, and flora is very much his kind of counterpart she is She's cool. She's collected. She's in control. She doesn't panic. She doesn't get flustered. Whereas he loves the scene and he loves the buzz and he loves the drama of it all. So they work very well as a, as a, as a pair. And I think that he realizes that he needs her. Um, but I liked the fact that with him sailing so close to the wind, that really pushes her buttons because that's everything that she's not. So it creates tension mm. between them as well. So... Yeah. No, that's a great point. I also really like that phrase, sailing close to the wind. Yes. I'm going to steal that. Yeah. Like that <laughs> yeah. One. Uh, okay. And so, yeah. And, and then uh, and then Inez is one of Flora's best friends and is really fiercely protective of her throughout the book. Uh, why is it so important for Flora to have someone like that? And um, to me, it's, that's, that's, I mean, I wish I had, uh, maybe I do, I don't know, I, I, hadn't, I haven't gotten to the, quite those situations, but um, I feel like it, it's important for people to develop their own friend like that. I mean, so why do you feel like it's so important, and, and is there a way that you think we can go about cultivating someone like that in our lives? Yeah, I think she's massively important to um, to Flora because I think in a way she's almost a wish fulfillment fantasy. I think that she is everything that Flora would love to be. She's very free. She comes from a very privileged background, much like Flora. There's um, you, but whereas Flora is almost contained by the expectation upon her, for Inez, it has freed her, and she, she's. A true bohemian, and I mean that in terms of true bohemian spirit. She's very free spirited. You know, she's she's madly in love with her boyfriend Bruno, who's a pro skateboarder, who of course is everything her parents would not want her to be with. You know, but um, she loves him, and she's she's living life according to her rules and her feelings. And and I think for Flora, that's incredibly liberating to be around her. Um, and and. It was kind of great to have the two of them living together in Paris whilst Flora is going through this change from being a very, you know, folded down version of herself to getting nearer to her truer nature and, and falling in love for the first time herself, too. Um, and so I just I really love Dinez. And again, I sort of knew her from the get go. I really totally could see who she was and how she would live and just her, she was completely fully formed in my mind sometimes you get to the end of a book and you only get to know them in the last hundred pages with Inez I knew her within the first page of writing her hmm. yeah that's really interesting uh so yeah let's I mean getting back to Flora later in the book Flora obviously goes through a ton of changes th throughout the book. I mean, her her entire personality, everything she knows is challenged. She she's <laughs> she goes through a lot. And at one point, you write that Flora didn't recognize the person she'd become. She'd become deceitful, reckless, bitter, manipulative. Um, maybe talk about why her personality changed so drastically, or or how you were able to write that and, and why you felt that was so important. Mm. You know, she could have tried to hold on to her kind of cool, calm and collected mentality throughout, but I I almost felt like she allowed herself to be dragged away by the intrigue and, mm. and uh, everything that was happening. Yes, I mean, the accusations that are leveled at her brother, I think provoke in her such anger and a, a sense of injustice, which is coupled with at the same time, she's um, fighting feelings for someone that she she knows on paper is everything that she shouldn't. He's everything that she shouldn't go for. He's everything. He's dangerous compared to her world. Um, he's going to break her heart. He'll he'll dump her. He's no good. There's no future. And she's just primarily attracted to him. And and that sort of goes against her nature. It goes against her good girl upbringing. And so she, on the one hand, she's battling these sort of darker desires in herself, plus her brother, who is her, her sort of her ally in life. They're incredibly close. Um, and, and 
suddenly his world, the most terrible things, things are being leveled at him and his world is being up, turned upside down and she feels so impotent and so so useless. And, you know, she's outside of the loop and what can she do? And I think that anger and a sense of injustice has a massively transforming effect on people um, and just can, can turn you into someone you didn't know you were capable of being. Um, and and I really think that's what happens to her. I think that, that that's the point at which she's beginning to tear down the walls of her house and emerge anew. Um, but it's almost taking that for it to happen. It would never yeah. have happened if she'd stayed within on her on her chosen path. You know, she's sort of suddenly the world, the world, which has always been very kind to her, suddenly not so kind. She's she's at the bottom of the wheel of fortune now. And, you mm. know, she's um, she's struggling and she's having to sort of reform. It's almost like she's going to war. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, and, and, and that's what she's dealing with. She's immersing herself day in day out with with horror you know what happened yeah you know the, the way that these artworks came to be in in the um in the possession of these new owners was horrific it was no different to a gun being put to these people's heads and and, and she would have known that as she was researching it um you know every single painting that was there was evidence of someone else's oppression and terror yeah. So we're, we're, we're tap dancing closer and closer to the, some of the deeper secrets in the book. Uh, and really, the book is, is all about layers upon layers upon layers of secrets. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's so interesting how in the first half of the book, you kind of get a big secret out and you think you understand what's happening. And in the second half, it just, just exponential increases in reveals and secrets and things coming together in interesting ways. So before we kind of delve into those, maybe just for everyone talk about a time in your life when you had a secret revealed oh my god um i don't think i ever have honestly honestly and truly well this is your chance if you <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly i honestly i have it you see this is actually where People say to me, oh, how much of you is in your characters? And I always say, no, no, really not. But out of all, all my characters, and I've written like 14 books now, so I've written a lot of characters. The one that's closest to me is probably Flora. Um, mm. She is pretty, pretty similar to me. I've had a very sort of uneventful life in that, oh, touch wood, no really terrible things have happened to me yet. And so... Um, I don't have. I, I've sort of got away with things <laughs> up till now. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, great. And then this book was uh, even more interesting then to me, knowing that all these secrets got spilled since yeah. you haven't had any yeah. as of yet. <laughs> all right. Good. Well, we'll check back in a couple of years and okay. see <laughs> see what you've got. Headlines. Here it is, folks. Your spoiler alert. If you plan on reading the book and don't want anything to be spoiled, skip ahead to about one hour and three minutes, and then finish, read the book, and come right back here, because there's plenty of great discussion ahead. So throughout the book, Flora is, and, and again, back to Flora, Flora is characterized as someone who's gorgeous, she has flings, but like you said, she can't find love. And she, is, she enjoys Noah's company, she sleeps with him, but ultimately breaks it off. Um, she's gotten told by everyone how bad Xavier was. And you wrote this really interesting passage, which I, I want to read uh, briefly. You wrote, he was more trouble than she could handle. And yet to her shock, her surprise, her horror, she wanted him to be the stereotype, the man in the headlines, the one Inez keeps, kept warning her about. He might be no good for her. He might be the biggest mistake she'd ever make. He might be fire, but she still wanted to play. Why was, why was Flora so drawn to that? Why was Flora so drawn to Xavier? And why do you think they ultimately end up together? I think that that's the point at which she, she's finally sort of cast off her old image. I mean, what's happened is she's fallen in love. Um, she wasn't looking for it. She didn't want it. She thought that if it ever happened, it would be something that was within her control, that she would 
marry a man like her father. You know, she would live a life like her mother. Um, and it's a, an enormous shock for her to be confronted with this man who's everything she shouldn't want. And yet she does, because that's just how the laws of attraction work. You don't get a say in it. You know, it's either there or it isn't. And she she's sort of been trying so long to, and she she's sort of always been very defined as being the good girl and he is very much the bad boy and so many things have sort of come in at once and and that at that particular point where that passage you've just read that's the point at which she doesn't care anymore she's to hell with it you know she she's had enough she's yeah. she's busting out of here she wa she wants a new life she wants to feel yeah that's critical moment then uh, so the book's first half deals with the provenance of the discovered art and really that's that's the entire first half i would argue is mm. trying to figure out what's happening there uh, but i really feel like the second half is, is the provenance of families and both Flores and the Vermeys. And so halfway through the book, we've got a, one of the biggest secrets, which you, which you already kind of alluded to, which is that the Vermeys didn't just work with the Nazis, they, they were Nazi collaborators. And this, this news is just completely shocking to everybody. And so I'm just curious about how that affected the family and the family's influence in the world. And then maybe a deeper thought is, to what extent should the charity and good that wealthy people do uh, be accepted if those people have acquired their wealth through questionable means? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so on the first point, we are all, I think, so defined by our family without even knowing it. You know, Flora is completely a product of living a very nice English middle class life. Um, the accusations that are leveled at her brother are world breaking i mean they are absolutely devastating and and they affect their 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 sort of understanding of themselves as who they are as people and how they're going to be perceived um and it's a very similar thing that's happening in xavier's family where suddenly having enjoyed a very public profile a very exalted status suddenly they are outed and they are properly outed as Nazi collaborators and the shame that is associated with that. And, you know, we will talk about the sins of the father and, you know, how culpable are they? They weren't the ones who, you know, who, who did these actions, but they have profited from them. And, and the shame from that, and, and it was pretty challenging writing the scenes for Jacques and Lillian who, have sort of enjoyed being these, you know, li living life at a certain level and being recognized as great benefactors and fantastic patrons of charities and um, philanthropy. And to suddenly, everything is sullied, it's tawdry and you're, and you're shunned. And I think even now it's, you know, a very, a very tricky, point. I mean, there, there was a piece in the papers over here only two weeks ago that a painting that's hung in London in a public building in London has just been returned to a family in uh, in Amsterdam, having just been proven to have been stolen during the war. And, it had, um, and you know, it's still going on. Um, it, al although what's happening now, of course, is that all those people in the war, many of them are very, very elderly, if not dead. And it's going to become harder and harder to restitute those stolen collections with the original owners. A lot of it is going to be lost really to the annals of time because an awful lot of the paperwork created by the, the Nazis was forged. It was falsified. So you, even the, the paper trails don't tell the whole truth. You, you know, people were not signing over these collections from free will. They did it because they were told that they would be given safe passage or a flight out of the Third Reich, which did not necessarily happen. So, um, you know, the, the way that these um, collections have been, you know, transferred to other families that have then profited from them is very, very dark and disturbing. Um, but at what point, where do you draw the line in the sand? You know, Jacques and Lillian are fundamentally good people. They're flawed. Their marriage is not perfect. 
they're arguably not the greatest parents in the world, um, but they're decent, honorable people. And they are horrified by what they find out when his father is revealed to be this Nazi collaborator. Um, and it's, I, I mean, I don't have an answer for it because I, I think that, you know, what can you do? What can they do? They, they can't return the artworks to those families because they don't literally don't know who they belong to. Um, I suppose if you're doing good works, if you are a benefactor and you're a philanthropist, maybe that that is enough. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not something I try and find an answer to in the book. Um, but for sure, there's there's definitely shame. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting because the Jacques does try and come up with a solution, right? Or, mm. or part of a solution. You know, he he wants to try and find out who the real owners are. Mm. He wants to uh, sell the paintings that have no owners and and donate the money to, um, I think, to, to some kind of a, a new charity fund that he establishes. So, you know, he definitely makes an effort to to right those wrongs. Um, I guess what what I was thinking about was, do you, do you feel like that's, do you think that was an honest effort? Do you feel like that was more for him and his family to try and feel better about it? Or do you think he was really making an effort to, to right the wrongs and, and yeah, make things I, better for everyone else? I did. I really had um, faith in Jacques's integrity. I really did. I um, felt that he, he needed to do that, that he was an honorable man and that his disgust at his father's actions was genuine um, and it mm. wasn't just to do with the loss of status or the public shame in the press. It was, for me, it was his way of tr trying to do something, you know, to, to make up for what his father had done. Yeah. Well, we also have this, we haven't mentioned this character at all, Stefan, but he's He's just a sort of a friend of Flora's, and he's a journalist. And there was a, a part earlier in the book when kind of they were all hanging out and talking about what was going on. And Flora was, you know, trying to hang out with her friends and have a good time and tell tell them a little bit about what she was up to. And she just mentioned a couple little things, and she thought was, you know, she thought this was entirely off the record and between friends. And Stefan went off and, you know, did put two and two together and, and, and uh, the researchers at his magazine put even more together and ended up writing this piece about the Vermeers and their true nature and, and it was public and it got out there before Flora even knew what was happening and just completely caused chaos. <laughs> even more chaos was, was caused in the book due to that and to Flora's life. So she was furious at Stefan and just all of Flora's friends that were also Stefan's friends stopped talking to Stefan and, you know, all this, all this bad stuff happened. So I, I think it's really interesting because it's an instance of having your trust destroyed. So maybe talk about what it's like to have your trust in someone destroyed and how Flora changes because of that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's devastating. I think that if you have a private conversation with with a friend and they they t take your words and use them for personal profit, personal glory, that is such a fundamental betrayal uh, and incredibly hard to come back from that. Um, he isn't trying to betray Flora per se. He has an ongoing feud with Xavier, so there's no love lost between the men. Um, and, and he believes, possibly quite rightly as a journalist, that the truth should come out and that he owes them nothing and that if if the grandfather did this then then the nation the world deserves to know so it's not that he's necessarily flawed in that decision making it, it's just the way he goes about it um and and the fact that he it was more to settle a score with xavier and than to to really um any any sort of sense of bringing truth to the world. Um, and, and I think for Flora, again, that, that adds to her feeling of besieged, being besieged and her world breaking down, you know, who can she trust? And, you know, everything that's going on at home with her brother and, and her job, you know, she's under enormous pressure. And then even with her friends, you know, she, she's, there's not the comfort there. There's not the support there that she might've thought she had. 
Um, and and it, it's really a shedding of innocence. You know, she's 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 been sheltered and the world has been life has been kind and it really isn't now. And she's having to toughen up. You know, she she's got to sort of reach for her inner core, in her inner steel and um, and really step up and fight back. She can't you know, she's going to be a victim otherwise. And I don't like writing about victims. <laughs> mm. yeah. So, yeah, I think this takes us then into into Natasha, interestingly. Uh, and we and we touched on this earlier about Natasha being kind of the typical Euro trash and how Natasha and Flora really got into it many, many times throughout the book. And, you know, as Flora ends up living on their, their property, she just tries to avoid Natasha as much as possible. So the reader really just is presented with this character that's a, not a good person, just someone you do not want to be around, mm. someone that's crazy, someone that's wild, just, you know, r ridiculous, trying to party and cause trouble. And you just completely shatter that illusion, right? You, you have Xavier tell Flora about what happened, that Natasha was raped, and this caused her to behave in this, in this way, and it really just devastated their whole family. And, you know, it, it, it made me think about Natasha completely differently, mm. which I assume was the point. So I, it's a bit tricky, right? Because up until that moment, we didn't have any reason to question her actions beyond that she's just a crazy, precocious mm. kid. And now we find this out. So to me, it's, it's an interesting test of a, of a person, right? It, it's about better... It's about bettering ourselves to try and look beyond behaviors to try and understand why people are acting in a certain way. So do you, do you think that there is anything that we can do to do that? And, and how should we feel? I mean, should, should the reader be ashamed for sort of judging Natasha without knowing the full story? Mm. I mean, I think it's incredibly difficult for anyone not to judge her because her, her behavior is so extreme. And in your face, you know, she doesn't go quietly into the night. She's absolutely in your face and you know she she's aggressive um in every scene that she's in she's she's almost like an animal she's out of control she's physically out of control she's socially out of control and of course when you're presented with that it makes you you instinctively recoil because it goes against all the mores of social behavior um so i i did want the the reader to feel estranged from her and not like they were particularly liking her. And I, th I think that's human. I, I think that as as much as we want to empathize with everyone, we, we can't possibly, we, we cannot know everybody's journey. And very often we have to take people at face value. You know, you know, we, we can't know everyone intimately. And what's so tragic about Natasha is that this devastating incident has happened. And She's put herself back together again, but she's all jagged and she's broken and she's incredibly fragile. And that's just how it manifests itself. It, it's not um, it's not a sympathetic. Um, she, she's not a sympathetic victim, but she is a victim. And I I just because obviously I knew what I was going to be revealing. I, on the one hand, was infuriated by her. On the other hand, I just wanted to hug her um, because it, it was devastating what happened to her. And and I delayed sort of revealing what happened to her for so long because I wanted the, the two the two rape allegations to, against Freddie and happening to her to sort of come together at the same time. And you're seeing both sides of different sides of the same coin and how devastating it can be if it's false and if it's true, depending on which side of the, the fence you're on. You know, it's devastating for a man to falsely be accused of rape. And obviously it goes without saying it's devastating for a woman to be raped. So I, I just found it fascinating to have two families come together who were c completely victims of the same crime in completely different ways. And Freddie is a much more sympathetic victim because he's open, he's vulnerable. But Natasha hasn't reformed herself in that way. And she's she's prickly. And really her only protection in the world is Xavier. He is 
completely her defender and he's riven with guilt that he of course couldn't help her it was all too late and you know I, I just think that although it would be nice to think that we can not judge people to a certain element we're always going to un until we know better and mm. um, I don't think the reader should feel guilty for thinking harshly of her because she's not done anything to to earn empathy before we learn the truth and that's just mm -hmm. her way of dealing with it you know some you know everyone deals with pain in different ways and for her it's not the soft cuddly way but she's no less injured and she's no less lovable and I, I found it that that scene when Flora helps save her again because she's almost putting herself in situations of reenacting um, the attack. You know, it, it's almost uh, she, she, she's living so dangerously. Um, and you, you finally see the warmth in her. You see. You see her humanity. And I loved writing that scene. Yeah. Yeah, that was really powerful. And and we we've touched on it now uh, for a bit, but Flor, Flora's brother Freddie is is one of the book's earliest mysteries. You know, you, and you really sort of did this thing where you were leaving crumbs and bits of information along uh, the whole story, and that was affecting Flora. But you you didn't let us in on what was actually going on. So we just had to sort of watch Flora get upset and watch the conversations they were having and try and come up with what was going on. And I thought that was very interesting because even as all these other secrets were getting revealed and everything else was happening, we still didn't quite know what was going on. And it wasn't until very late in the book that you revealed the rape allegation. And I'm just curious about why you started the book that with that and, you know, had these little bits and crumbs and pieces and and then led us towards that moment where you revealed it much later in the book and the problem was solved, you know, right at the end of the book. Mm. Um, it, it, it was mainly to destabilize um, Flora yeah. so that she, you know, he, he is her bedrock. He is her closest friend and confidant. You know, they're, they're very, very close siblings. And f for such a terrible thing to be leveled against him, devastates her as much as him she's incredibly worried about him he's not coping well um and and she feels awful guilt that you know she's not in the country she's over in, in france she's down she's in paris and then she's down in antibes in the south of france she's far away from him at a time when she feels that he needs her but there's also nothing she can actually do to help um and so i i sort of wanted to um bring that in early to sort of rattle her cage to just throw her off balance so that when she then enters the the the, the gilded world of the vermeys and and starts to dig and find out these tawdry secrets um she's sort of broken down further um so it, it was partly that i also then wanted to have it so that when you found out what had happened to Zav uh, what had happened to natasha and what had happened to Freddie and how actually they were on opposing sides of this fundamental argument. It was something that forced them apart. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of pathos that they just sort of come together and she, she was sort of finally allowing herself to love the man she loved and live the life she wanted to live only for them to be forced apart by circumstances that have affected the people that they love most in the world. And it feels like an impossible situation because how, how can the man she loved, if his, if his sister was so brutally attacked, how can he possibly count as being with a woman whose brother is accused of the exact same crime? Yeah. So right at the end of the book, there, I think there's sort of another last second dramatic uh, secret reveal that again switches your perceptions. I think a lot of the the secrets coming out in this book are are about taking what had happened and forcing you to see it through a new lens, which is very interesting to me. So throughout the book, we're presented with this idea of Franz von Teschelt, and later we learn 
you know, Franz Fermier, and he was a Nazi collaborator. So we're, you know, the, the big halfway through the book reveal reveals him to be a very bad person. And then at the end of the book, we learn from Magda that, you know, all of a sudden he was actually doing some good as well. You know, he was, he was helping smuggle children away. Uh, you know, Jacques was, uh, I guess, adopted by, by them and taken care. Uh, he was taken care of by them. So again, it's sort of a reversal where this, the perceptions that we had of this person were changed. Um, you know, so, so what do you think those perceptions were up to that point? And how, how then were you expecting readers to change and, uh, and modify their perception, perceptions of Franz and everything else that had happened in the book up to that point? I wanted it to be like a gunshot, like a, a, a real moment of slack-jawed shock that, you know, we've, we've stood in judgment we have sort of taken the the view that the the world has taken against the Vermeys. You know, you are Nazi collaborators. You are shamed. You you are deeply flawed. You are shunned. And then you find out that actually, it's not that simple. And yes, he he worked with the Nazis. He had to work with the Nazis to to ensure his family's survival because. I suppose when you get down to a life where you're choosing on a daily basis, when you're trying to protect your family on a daily basis, you're choosing life and death. He may have felt that was the only option open to him. But the bravery that it would have taken to deceive the Nazis, to, to write in front of them, to, to have been that close and to have, through a sleight of hand, tricked them and and many people did do that and and it sort of harks back to my point earlier about in times of war ordinary people do extraordinary things and you can choose to become a villain or or a hero and we've sort of judged him throughout as a villain rightly but in my mind he really wasn't at all you know he he did what had to be done to you know there was no way as a as a jewish dealer there as a jew full stop that he was going to survive this now he could either just try to flee he and his wife just flee to switzerland and and escape and be safe um or he, you know they stayed and he tried to help others and their friends um jacques real family left it too late. They thought that their money would protect them. They thought that there was still time to go. And this happened to a lot of families. Their, their money and their wealth protected them for quite a long time until suddenly it didn't and the borders were sealed and it was too late and it suddenly didn't matter who you knew. You couldn't get out. You, you, it didn't matter if you had a, a, an incredibly valuable collection to, to sell, to barter, to get, to get out. They, they would simply sign it um, into a, an account. The money would just go into a blocked account and you would find yourself being arrested anyway. So he made a, a decision to work, to appear to be working with them to help other people, to help the most vulnerable, the, these children. And yeah, I mean, I, I think it's incredible. And although it's not based on one person in particular, there were people out there doing that. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I loved it. I loved it. And to me, he's a hero. Yeah. Well, that wraps up kind of the main questions I had for the book. But I always like to ask, you know, are, are there any other lessons or anything else you hoped people would get from the book that we haven't had a chance to talk about? Um. I suppose kindness, you know, just don't judge because until you've walked in someone's shoes, you don't know their journey. Um, and, and, and a lot of what this book is about is about judgment. People making accusations, making allegations, um, living under false identities, pretending to be something that they're not. And, and the truth is always far more complicated and varied than that. No one is ever entirely good or entirely bad. Well, very few people are entirely bad, but I'm sure there are some. But, you know, it's 
it's about the shades of grey. And um, this book to me is about a woman finding her true nature, her true self, her true life, shedding a perfectly lovely straightened world for something something truer. And I'm not about perfection, but I am about freedom. And mm. um, I don't mind my characters being flawed um, as long as they feel real. Oh, that's great. So uh, you mentioned uh, right at the beginning that you were about to sit down and write uh, soon a new book. Can you maybe uh, give us a sneak peek or talk about what's next for you and, and what you plan to be working on? So I've literally just come back two days ago from Norway. Uh, so I'm going to set next Christmas's book because in England, I have a book that comes out every Christmas. And then I also in the summer have a book that comes out. So the, uh, the Paris Escape, the Paris Secret, sorry, is uh, one of my summer books in the UK. Um, so I've just finished writing next summer's book called The Greek Escape. Um, and I'm about to start next Christmas's book, which will be based in Norway. And I'm just sort of finalizing the plot details at the moment for that. But it's uh, it's a bit woolly. <laughs> I need to make some notes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, it's something to look forward to. Yeah. It's exciting. And you said the Greek... The Greek Escape? Yes, yeah. Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm detecting a theme in the titles here. Yeah. The Paris Secret, The Greek Escape. Exactly, and The Rome Affair, that came out the this summer, and that was that did mm. well. That was so much fun to write. That was a past-present yeah. storyline, so I sort of split the book in two, um, and, it, well, I interspersed past with present, past with present, which was so much fun. Yeah, I definitely oh, want to do that great. again. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I'd like to end with a thunder round, just a couple quick getting to know you questions, and then we'll we'll call it a day. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. So first off, what's your favorite food and or drink? Uh, my favorite food is my mother's roast chicken, <laughs> mm -hmm. and my favorite drink would be a tie between tea and champagne. <laughs> Ooh. I don't know which I could live without. Yeah. Don't okay. Hopefully either. not at the same time. Yeah. But, <laughs> but they both sound great. Yeah. Uh, what's so you've traveled a lot so I, I'm curious to hear your answer to this question what's what's your favorite place you've ever been well I love Norway oh my god I love mm -hmm. Norway uh, but I think I loved it so much because it was very like Scotland but on a massive scale uh, my father's Scottish so I spent a mm -hmm. huge amount of time in the highlands growing up um, oh god I've been to so many amazing places um, I think if I had to say one I would say I'd actually say Cornwall in the UK. Okay. I, yeah, I mean, God, I've in the last few months I've been to Canada, I've been to Greece, I've been to the Maldives, I've been to Norway, I've been to so many places. But I do love coming back to England, and Cornwall is my favorite spot in England. Yeah, that sounds great. All right, if you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and why? Any one thing about myself or... It, it could be anything. anything. It's a very powerful magic wand. Oh, my God. Well, I would definitely stop time, that's for sure. Um, yeah, Ooh. yeah, yeah. No, I just, everything is happening too quickly. My kids are growing up too fast. I sort of feel like, although I don't believe in perfection, I do feel that life is good. I feel like I'm sort of coming up the wheel of fortune. I wouldn't say I'm on the top of it, mm. but I'm coming up. And I'd quite like to just press pause. <laughs> Press right. pause at about 11 o'clock. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's what Sounds I'll do. Nice. Okay, I'll take it. All right, well, Karen, thanks so much for being on the show. The book, again, The Paris Secret. Everyone should go out and read it. Um, it is an amazing book full of secrets and full of fascinating places and characters and art, and it's just beautiful. And, Karen, it's been a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. Mm -hmm.